What's up, everybody? It's your boy C Rock on the What Are You Made Of with Mike C Rock podcast. Sponsored by Nations Lending, making home loans human. Shout out to all the people at Nations for supporting this podcast, supporting my group at Nations Lending, and supporting your boy C Rock. I really appreciate you guys and thankful to have you uh, on our team. So, today's show, we have my man Travis Fox. And Travis has a very awesome story. I want, I want you guys to hear it. And we all know if you listen to previous episodes, but this podcast is about using your past experiences, events, things that have happened to you, good or bad, and using them for your, your future life as training sessions to overcome hurdles, obstacles, and also when things are going great, awesome, push to the next level. So uh, Travis, over the last 28 years, has devoted his life to his passion to helping people escape the imaginary walls they've placed before themselves by channeling his own past experiences and providing a loose format for pressing the pause button and reorganizing their lives around what really motivates them and in the end, makes it all worth it. But before, he was limited by an inability to speak to more than one person at a time, and now he's been able to reach thousands of people at any given time thanks to the technological advances of our, of our society. It's these great gifts to society as a whole that has allowed Travis to create systematic tools to help you break through habits that no longer serve you or your passions. So listen, Travis, what are you made of? I believe everyone's got a story. What's your story, brother? (laughs) Well, I'm not sure the show's long enough for my entire story, brother, but we'll we'll give it a go. Uh, What am I made of? That's a really great question. I think the question that I always started with is, what am I not made of? Right. And I came from the other perspective. And I think a lot of people have gone through that journey of, gee, I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy enough. I'll never be the cool kid. You know, I'll never be the rock star, you know, not in that space. And so for me, my life started very uniquely from the perspective that uh, uh, I I grew up for the most part of my first 10 years of my life outside the United States. I was in Japan and Germany. My mother was a model and an actress, and my father was a fighter pilot. So for those of you old enough to remember the original Top Gun, that was not my life. It was a complete opposite. It was a crash and burn. Um, and so there's a couple of key things that came through that process. Uh, one, when we had a brief stint in Florida between uh, Japan and Germany, my father was kind of this, you know, overall sportsman. He comes from the, the cornstalk days of Michigan and, you know, you just played every sport because that's what you did. And he was just kind of good at everything, but not great at anything. And he put a golf club in my hand and, uh, I was natural. And so, uh, by the time I was, you know, 11, 12 years old, I was running, you know, single digits and then ultimately went scratch and, and I had my whole life planned out for me. I don't know how many of you had that experience, but, you know, I was going to be the next Tiger Woods. We grew up in that, you know, I'm a little bit older than Tiger, but we all grew up in that era in Southern California and, and uh, we, this is golf was going to be, and I was playing golf and golf was still wasn't cool. We had those little metal spikes and, you know, we still wore plaid pants and all the other goofy crap. And, and uh you know, my life was about what my father wanted me to be. And I didn't realize that until I had my first real big emotional crisis. And it wasn't around golf. It was around something completely different. Uh, My senior year in high school, I I made an interesting, uh, what ended up becoming a subconscious choice, Um, got in a relationship with a girlfriend and um, and ultimately we became pregnant. And we had our, uh, I had my first child when I was 17. I don't know about many of you, but who has had that experience, it changes the course of your life instantaneously. And the second part of that was, was that, uh, unfortunately, we didn't raise that child together. She did a, what's called a midnight run. And basically, her and her parents decided that it was better for all of us that she was whisked off over midnight. And so I never got to see the birth of that child and knew there was a child out there with my, you know, my, my name and my genes on it. And I didn't know how to handle that emotionally. I had no training whatsoever at all. Uh, became, I went from a great uh, golfer to a total head case, just instantaneously overnight. And I went into, started to go into university and all of the passion, everything I thought I had spent the last 15 years of my life devoted to the summers, the thousands of golf balls a day, the blisters on my hands. When my friends were out doing, you know, summer vacation, I'm on the driving range, playing golf, playing tour events. And, uh, I all of a sudden I had this cathartic moment where I realized I needed help psychologically. And I, it wasn't because I needed, you know, the work on what I thought was, you know, big issues. It was, I just need to figure out how to hit the golf ball down the middle of the fairway. Cause you know, I'm going to lose my scholarship. My dad's going to be pissed. Right. Right. I, I right. Figure this shit out now. And, uh, well, by I, the way, I, not, not to cut you off, but, yeah. uh, I don't know if you know much about me and I don't talk about this too much. I should talk about it more. Golf is a, is a passion of mine. Uh, Ooh. I absolutely love it. I didn't um, know that. Yeah. I, I haven't gotten down to a scratch, but I'm, uh, four, 
four handicap. So it's pretty done. It's pretty good, brother. You know, down there, it's about quarter strokes, right? Yeah. 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 So what we'll talk about our index is like 4.2, 4.3, but uh, you know, it's one of the lessons and I'll let you get into this more, but with the golf and let's just say for that happened and then golf didn't go further from that. The one thing I know that you got out of golf and you you know this already, but I'm just sharing this for the audience is the, the grind that you did, the effort, the work, the, like you said, the blisters on your hands. If you want to be great at something, that's what it takes, man. And, and I always talked about this. Uh, I wrote a blog about the journey is invisible. A lot of people didn't see you out there doing that. Still but, they, but, but they think, man, he's just a naturally good golfer. Oh, right. wow. You know? So I wanted to point that out with that story. Yeah, because, uh, I, yeah man, I didn't, I didn't know that. Yeah. Matter of fact, uh, well, the irony of all of that was uh, through that process, I went through, you know, I went to the psychology department. We didn't have sports psychology back then. We had, you know, standards, you know, cognitive psych. And they really wanted to do this kind of Freudian model on me. You know, we knew, how do you feel about your mom and your dad? And they said, look, I, I really don't give a crap about that. I need to figure out why I'm standing over the golf ball. And I'm thinking these just random thoughts that I would never think, but clearly I'm thinking them. So where the hell do these thoughts come from? And no one was able to really just tell me how my brain was working. And so from the beautiful, uh, you know, from the beautiful ashes rises the Phoenix, ironic that I was born in Phoenix, Arizona, um, became my true passion. And I met my mentor uh, and I sat under Doc for 15 years and he trained me and uh, I got, ended up getting, uh, you know, a couple uh, doctoral degrees. And my whole passion was understanding how does our brain work in the, on this thing we call our spacesuit, our body, and how can I make it apply to the world and so that people didn't have to go through the, the effects that I went through. And that was my original intention, right? I, I was going to go save the world because, you know, the you know, great Dr. Fox was here because I was going to replace one passion with another. Two things came out of that experience that have altered the course of my life to my true alignment. One is I realized I was playing golf for all the wrong reasons. I was playing for my father, for my father's approval to, you know, get my father to be, be validated for all the effort, money, time, and experience, not validating myself through the process because you're right. I'm the one that sat on the range and hit the, the golf balls until my hands bled. I, you know, walked 36 holes, sometimes even more in a weekend so, or a day so I could play to get better and become almost obsessive, you know, to the point, and I'm, I'm an ex recovering perfectionist. I don't know about you, Mike, but I am. And I realize that you know, perfectionism in golf is a deadly addiction. It is absolutely insane. It'll make you a little bit batshit crazy. And I kind of went that place. So my dissertation, um, for one of my degrees came in is called, are you afraid of the bogeyman? And it was this whole psychological study on the effects of cognitive psych, clinical hypnotherapy and NLP at the time on the uh, mental side of golf. And you said, that, and you said, let me clarify. You said the bogeyman. Correct. Right. Golf. Like one over playoff. car. Right. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> because the bogeyman, is, you know, I was used to ask when I was on tour and I was coaching, you know, and I've, I've had the pleasure to coach, you know, some very top end high end names, work with them. And I was on there for 10 years and it was with XM radio and the PGA tour golf channel, all those things. And I always ask the same question. Do you know how to make a birdie? And of course, every pro's like, yeah, of course. I'm like, great. Do you know how to stop making bogeys? No. Boom. That's where we need to go hang out because the bogeys is where we get in our own head. And then that, that whole journey became an application called Architect the Bean that you see behind me of how do we architect our life? How come we don't educate people how to run their conscious mind, their subconscious mind, their spacesuit, their body, which is the number one relationship you're going to have the entire time here on planet Earth. And yet is the last thing we ever really invite people to look at. We only look at it when it's in a traumatic state, whether we've had a death or you know, I lost my job or you know, maybe the dismemberment of my body. Then we go look at it. Well, yep, that's a pass yep. backwards model. That makes no sense. So no, my life. You, 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 you know, I, I preach about this a lot. I preach about proactiveness instead of reactiveness mm -hmm. and getting ahead of the game. And one thing with our business right now, like we're, we're going great. I'm in the mortgage business as well, besides doing the podcast and speaking and all. Yeah. Uh, and the mortgage business is really good. This 2019 was great. Yep. But what I'm focused on right now and I'm preaching to my team is we need to be uh, proactive on when the next downturn comes and what we need to do to be prepared for that. So we keep rolling and, and rolling and rolling right now. But what happens when the economy takes a tank or the rates go up or, or something happens? What are we going to do? We need to know so that when it happens, we grab market share and everybody else is woe as me and, and, and you know, licking their wounds and all that. And we're just attack mode, attack mode. Sure. And so this goes hand in hand with that, that, that message I keep talking about, proactive versus reactive. Proactive, mm -hmm. be prepared. And so, well, it's impossible. Yeah. Let me dive on that. If, you're, if we're talking to your team, let's talk to your team. Okay, you say you need to be proactive versus reactive. Well, you have to first of all know what you're reactive to. What, what is your default mechanism? So if you're not understanding the patterns of your brain and how we actually neuroconnectivity actually create belief structures, you're subject to being reactive 
who cares? I don't, you can say it all day long until you're blue in the face. You're still going to react. No right. different than, you know, you, as soon as you hit a shot, you, your first thing out of your mouth is, ah, crap. You knew as soon as you hit impact. Or, right? or other line, words. Or other things. words. <laughs> yeah, there's a few other words that go along with it. I'm setting myself. Oh, man, I pulled that one. I knew it as soon as I hit it. <laughs> you yeah. know. Or, or I knew I was going to do it and I still hit the shot. Well, yeah. okay, that's not proactive. That is not only completely yeah. reactive, it is masochistic because yep. you knew hit the shot change the club do something different no i gotta hit the shot all right well then just shut up and deal with it and so first of all you got to know what you're reactive to what is your you know i, I talk about this a lot my, my next book coming out next year is all about becoming addicted to your life and we have such a misnomer about what addiction is i'm like well wait a minute addiction isn't always just a crackhead on the street but what's really cool about studying addiction is people who are addicted to things and we're all addicted to something so anybody listening to the show says you're not an addict you're First of all, that's your first addiction is that you think you're not an addict. So you're right. addicted to something, right? Sex, right. drugs, rock and roll, you know, winning the game, selling houses, screwing mortgages, you know, helping transformational work, whatever, but we're addicted to it. But the question is, are we addicted in a way that is empowering or are we addicted in a way that's disempowering? And so, for example, being a perfectionist and trying to, you know, be a professional golfer on the PGA Tour is a very disempowering combination because you're constantly kicking the shit out of yourself and I'm a master at it. I've got black belts and kicking Travis's butt. And so the entire concept of architecting is what if we created a system and we've done this, you know, for years now of how do we ask the right questions to dismantle our mind? How do we understand how our conscious mind, subconscious mind works and way down here, this beautiful thing we like to ignore called our heart because we act like it doesn't really exist until we're finally at the end of our life. In that case, it's too late. So the first of all is what are we reactive to? How come we're reactive? What does it do for us to be reactive and keep the pattern going? And ultimately, what is it we really want and what are we avoiding by being reactive? Because the truth is to be proactive, you have to be truly aligned with what you really want. And that also then comes down, what do I really want? Well, gee, Mike, you know, I want to make $4 billion. The money is not what you're interested in. And so what's on the other side of that money that you're trying to create from an experiential level? I want to feel this way. I want to feel powerful. I want to feel like I've made it. I want to show my mom and dad that I wasn't a knucklehead, whatever, whatever you're driving it from. But you have to be willing to look in this thing that we call the beautiful darkness. And that darkness is inside places where we don't really want to go because we have to look at ourselves and look at ourselves as sometimes, which is odd, the scariest damn thing you'll ever do. It is one of the most challenging things. And yet, once you do it, you go, what was I waiting for? Holy crap, I've let all these years go by, all these experiences, these opportunities pass me by because I'm sitting there reactive, stuck in my head because we really don't teach people how to run their spacesuit. We don't. Yep. We teach them how to go to sleep really well though. We're good at that. Yep, yep, yep. So I, I just really had probably in the last two years, uh, and I'm 42 now, an enlightenment. And the light went off in my head. I had an itch to tell my story. Didn't understand that it was there. And it eventually came out. And, you know, it's about it when I was 11 years old. My story goes back to that, that 30 years ago. And my father gave it up on me. And you know what? It's not what I do now is driven by that. But it's not to get back at him or no. it's not about him. My story is about when, when I, that event happened, I decided, one, I wasn't going to let him win which is one thing that drives me, but that won't, that only lasts so long. But the second one, and it aligns with what you're doing mm -hmm. is that I couldn't be the only one that had been given up on by their father or anybody else. Yep. And I wanted to be a role model in everything I did. And I look back two years ago to this and I said, you know what? I've been doing this for 30 years. I want to be a role model and lead the way for people that have been given up on. And mm -hmm. that's what drives me. And so I found that, like I knew I was, I was already doing it. I just realized it two years ago hmm. and it blows me away that that, that took that long, but, uh, I'm 49. You're faster than me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just something that, you know, some events I went through that just started opening it up and something started yeah. knocking on my door, my, my brain. Yeah. And, uh, ever since I that, you, I, came, I would offer you it's your heart woke up and woke your head up, not your head woke up. If I may be so bold to say that. Right. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, whatever it was, I, I, uh, ever since I got the story out and started sharing it and, and get on this mission, everything's working now in, in hyperspeed, right? In production, everything is going fast and that's, it's an awesome thing. So got out of your own way, what a concept. Yep. So what are, what are some of the, just, you know, I know there's a lot to it, but if you could break it down into, uh, sh some steps or just a section of what you do as far as the steps from your system, mm -hmm. um, how would you, how would you do that as, you know, again, as short a time as possible. Yeah, sure. Uh, it's simple. The first three, there's six stages you can go through uh, the total journey of the architect of being. And then there's a, the, the sequel is to that is architecting your lifestyle, which is our, our entrepreneurial company called the ACE Initiative. And that stands for architects creating entrepreneurs. And so the first thing you do is take the jump. 
The jump is online. It's all recorded. It's uh, 14 hours. It comes to you every day. And it actually walks you through with step-by-step -step things through a three-prong approach. One is the, the clinical approach, understanding actually what's going on here in this puppy called your brain, conscious, subconscious, and shadow subconscious, and understand it from a perspective that makes sense. It's fun. It's educational, but you get it. And you really understand what we're talking about as opposed to a bunch of isms. I am an anti-ism guy. I don't even let people you know, try to put me as a motivational speaker. And I'm like, I'm really not motivational. I'll invite you to transform yourself. That's up to you. But me, I'm, I don't like motivation because it, it wanes and it's a constant, excuse me, it's a constant drug you have to stay addicted to. I got to motivate, I got to motivate. Well, if you, when you're really in your passion and you're being passionate, you don't need to be motivated. You just, it happens all by itself. Yep. hundred percent. So you start with the jump. And then you get the applicational part. What are those things you can do that day? And it shows you exactly how to do it, what to look for. How is your brain going to work so you can see what's, what it's not doing and what it is doing, both reactionary and proactive using, using your language. And then ultimately the back part is how do I apply that? How do I apply that to my relationship with myself, my relationship with my significant others, my business, my kids, whatever you need to apply it to. And then it goes you through the 14 days. And so you go through that process. And then from there, you can go to the AITs, which is the Architects in Training. That's a 14-week yeah, process. And then from there, if, if you're through it, well, you'll get invited to what's called Architecting Mastery. And that's 28 weeks of getting your ass kicked. You are going to learn how to architect at the deepest of levels and ultimately become an architect graduate. And then we help you launch your own brand because everybody, like your passion, for example, you woke up to that. Through the architectural process, your passion will be reignited and then we help you launch that brand into the world because there's a reason that that needed to be woken up in you and you're the only person that can deliver that message for this time. So let's go. So it doesn't have to be about competition. It's about the cooperative model of you awakening up to who you are because there's a, there is a purpose for you being here at this time. You may have forgotten it. You may have put yourself to sleep. You may have hypnotized yourself into believing that you're not uh, anything of, uh, but um, – not being a valid, but you are. I mean, is, you know, as the great Gary Vanderchuk likes to say, who's speaking at our next event, you know, hey, the odds of you being born is one to 400 trillion, some ridiculous number, yep. but you're here. So right. let's look at that. And then after that, after that, then you can get invited to advanced postgraduate work. But those are the first big three steps and you can just go through them. And they're, you know, the first, the first two are online and you have an architect advisor, one of my graduates that I personally train walks you through it, who have their own brands, who've done the same journey you have. And it doesn't matter as long as you're pink on the inside, and you're ready to wake yourself up, you can go through the architectural process and realize you are the architect of your life. And when you grab that, no different than yourself, well, life takes on a whole different experience, right? And it starts with this question, and there's two that I'll offer your audience. One is the noble truth, and every architect starts here, and that is acknowledging the fact that you're not getting off this planet alive, period. So start with that. And I know people go, well, yeah, I know that. Yeah, but you do everything you can to hypnotize yourself, distract yourself from that, well, someday it's gonna happen. That's a misnomer. You don't know that it's someday. And to approach your life that way is the ultimate disrespect to your journey because you don't know that. That is your ego talking. And the two, and this is a really powerful question, and maybe your team might want to address this when you guys do your, your, your calls, is if you only had 30 days left to live on this planet, would you be doing anything you're doing right now in your life across the board? And if any part of your answer is no, stop. And let's take a look at where you're reacting and ultimately what do you want to create and then from there, you're going to walk into the first thing, which is the most powerful one, is learning the difference between a decision and a choice. And they are radically different. And yet most people think that they are one and the same, and they're not. And so when you go through those first three things, the noble truth, the 30-day question, and decisions, and choi uh, decisions versus choice, you can really start to unwind some of the things that are keeping you from just experiencing life that you want to experience and just really own it. And that's when you start your dive into the jump, and then you go from there. So two things. One, it's an online first part. And then after that, you have some in person. Is, is that how it works or? Uh, yeah, we, absolutely. There's uh, it's online first, because if you, if you know, once you go through the jump and the jump is, you know, as, as our leader, you're going to get more in 14 hours and you're probably going to get most things out there. No disrespect to anything. You're going to get slammed. I, I don't, I'm not a rah-rah guy. Like I said up front, if you're looking for rah-rah, I'm not the guy. You should not hang out with me or the architects because we're going to go down the rabbit hole because that's where the truth is but it goes through a space where you can actually enjoy it, see results and un understand it instantaneously because the truth is change is instantaneous. It's a decision to make a change that takes time. That's where we jerk around and we excuse and we justify, rationalize, we do all kinds of crap. But once you make the change, it's bang, it's instant. Your brain rewires itself and it's neuroplasticity and the neuroconnectivity of things, it moves fast. I mean, it's a, one of the most complex things in the universe. We underestimate the power, man, so, <clears throat> so much, man. We underestimate it, we condemn it. Yeah. We, put it, we put it in prison and we ask it to do it. And then we go, well, how'd that happen? You did it. Own it. I know that's a big pill to swallow, but start there. 
and all external factors are doing their job to try to limit it and can and contain your brain power it's amazing how people try to hold other people's back or absolutely you know, and you go the other direction and go everything i see in my external world and one of the things i invite people to look at and it's kind of a radical philosophy but just to you know, go down the rabbit hole for a second is you know you're you know the world doesn't revolve around you but you are the center of your world so when you start looking at everything that's externally around you from a certain perspective as an architect of your own life, you're creating that at some unconscious level to get yourself to wake yourself up because we look through our own eyes. This is how we see the world. So when it comes back and we see it external, we can see ourselves and go, huh, wow, I didn't realize I was you know, being such an a-hole. I didn't realize that that's how I, you know, I cheat myself out of being the powerful being that I am. Oh, that's how I realize you know, I'm not good enough. Oh, that's how I realize you know, I compare myself to so-and-so. And you see it because you see it as an external person. So like if you and I are playing around the golf and Mike, you just you're crushing the ball past me. You're just you're hitting, you know. Hey, what, which we're going to at some point here in the future, by the way. Deal. Let's go and you, let's go play. You know, I play for the same bet every time: a dollar and a hot dog. That's it. My right. bet. I right. Play. right. And it's just about the experience of hey, what do I lean on? So I approach golf differently now. So when I play with my clients, and you know, I still coach guys, we go out and play. I play to watch to learn both how they process, but more importantly, what are they showing me about myself? You know, so let's say Mike's out there. He just, you know, you're, you're obviously you're a big guy. You're very well built. You probably beat the crap out of the ball off the tee. I can sit there and go, well, Mike's out driving by 30 yards and start getting in your game. And we do this so fast and we apply this to everything relationships. Well, he's got, he's got that car. He must be successful. How do you know? He might be leveraged to the hilt. Calm down. He might be trying to build, you know, not as, not, not as insecure because people might find out that maybe he's not, you know, what he thinks he is. So he's projecting an image, but we right. immediately put this thing on these people and realize it's a reflection of ourselves. I don't feel good enough. So that's why I say he or she is better than me or he or she is doing that or so and so or, or they must be cheating to get there. Yeah, you don't know that until you ask. And more importantly, how come we're so afraid to ask? Mike, how the hell are you hitting the drives 340 yards? I've been playing this game for 45 years myself. I played at the top levels. I played, you're just driving the ball past me. But instead of saying, going, man, admire it. Look at it and go, man, something about what Mike's doing at the top of his swing, the way his hand cocks down, the way he comes in and he snaps through the ball. Hey, Mike, would you mind showing that to me? I'd like to learn and, and learn it from a space of not that Mike's better than me. Just Mike happens to have a technique that allows his ball to go 20 yards right. longer than mine. Right. doesn't mean I can't well, play well. I can still make birdies too, right? He's still got to putt the same way I do. But it's amazing how we immediately take ourselves out of the game. And yet yeah. I'm like, wait a minute. The game has nothing to do with the other person. It's still reflection of yourself. So if you can come from the perspective of the world doesn't revolve around you, but you're the center of your world, you can start to identify patterns in yourself and thank the people who really piss you off, the people who upset you, because they're showing you the part of you that you need to deal with because you're too busy being so a reactive true. schmuck, right? So true, man. And what if, so and so true. architect, yeah, architect walks you through it so you understand it. You can go, oh, I get it. They're not the asshole. I am. Okay, cool. How did I become an asshole? What am I really afraid of? Let me unwind that. Let me see the pattern I created. Here's the belief structure. Here's the value system that drives it. Here's the emotion that I'm hiding from. Okay, great. Now I can unwind it. Bang. And now I can reprogram myself literally and start to create the life that I want. And it changes things. No different than your own awakening. There's not a more powerful drug on this planet than when you wake yourself up to realize you are the architect of your life and you're not getting off this planet alive. So wake up and let's go. Let's go now. Right? Simple. Yep. Yep. hundred percent, man. I, I, you know who I heard that from first was Grant Cardone. He said, you know, when people hate on me or say something, they're really talking about themselves. And I know that because I do it myself. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's transfer, right? We all do. It's transferism. You know, it's yeah. projectionism. We, and we do it and we do it as a way. But if you start to look at it from the perspective of a gift, and it's hard at first because, man, when you first start doing it, you're going to see there's a part of you you don't like. Yep. Because we've been really good at self-hypnotizing. We are the best hypnotist on the planet. That's why when people say, oh, you know, I got hypnotized, I'm like, bullshit. I have, a, I have a doctorate in clinical hypnotherapy. There is no such thing as hypnosis. The only hypnosis is you doing it to yourself. You just right. didn't realize you were doing it because we don't teach people in school, middle school, high school, university, of how it works. We teach you how to put yourself to sleep. We're really good at that. We'll yep. teach you to become a slave and to put yourself asleep and to pass through and mediocrity is okay and not to live the dreams that you want because in order to do that, you've got to give up something. I'm like, you don't have to give up anything. You have to give up being an a-hole perhaps or <laughs> give up your ego. Okay, but that isn't working for you anyway. So what are you really giving up? Let go because yep. you no, know, if you have 30 days left to live, I promise you, you'll shift your, you'll instantly shift your value structure. So why not to your credit, 
Stop being a reactive schmuck and be proactive and take an interest in your own life and become an addict to yourself. You can become addicted to it. And I don't mean obsessive, like, you know, self-narcissism or become a self-centered schmuck. Become addicted to the passion that you have so long ago put away when you exchange dreaming for doing and when you exchange believing for hope and when you exchange mediocrity for living the life that you really want to live and own that truth. And it's going to suck yeah. when you do, but when you finally own it, as you said, you can open yourself up to another enlightenment because there's a lot more out there than you could ever possibly imagine. Get out of your own way now. Yeah, I want to point something out uh, that relates, um, and I've been talking about this as well, but when I come home from work and my kids are acting up, or they're talking disrespectfully back to me, or my wife, you know, whatever the case is, talking, whatever. <laughs> I, one of the things I always do, and I, sometimes it takes me a little longer to do it. Sometimes I'm, it's immediate. Sometimes it might be a, like a couple days. I always start looking at myself in the mirror and say, what am I doing to cause that? Yeah. Taking a hundred percent responsibility because of that reflection. Wonderful. And I think, I really believe that it's a hundred percent of the time. It's a reflection of me. Yeah. I don't think yeah. there's times where, you know, and I look back and so. How can it a not? Of, a lot of people don't do that. A lot of people have marriages that are ruined or uh, parent child relationships that are ruined because they don't do that. And they blame the other person. They don't take any responsibility in the action. And, uh, you know, that's one thing I want to point out from what you just said there. That's, that's, a, that's a huge, huge light bulb moment yeah, for a lot look, of people. It take, look, let's, let's be honest. You don't have to be intelligent to be courageous. People think you have to be heroic to be a hero. It, it's heroic for you to do exactly what you're talking about. And Architect's all about that invitation. You are 100% responsible for every experience in your journey. And that is a big pill to swallow for a lot of people. Oh, yeah, Travis, you don't know, you know what happened when I was a child. Like, yeah, the hell you don't. I'm a product. I'm a survivor of molestation myself. So save that speech. Uh, yo, my parents were divorced. I'm a product of a double divorce out of Hollywood and a fighter pilot. What's your excuse? Right. It's how you choose to understand. I'm not talking about, you know, rah rah -ism because I'm not a fan of rah rah because it always fades. I'm talking about truly looking and going, that experience taught me something and I chose to create that experience even though I wasn't consciously aware of it at the time but deep down in places I don't want to talk about at cocktail parties we call that spirit heart soul chi whatever your word you want to put it we call it architect for simplicity your heart had you go through that experience so that you could someday look at it and go shit my purpose is about this now and I had to go through that experience because I can't reflect I can't invite I can't teach I can't heal from what I don't know experientially otherwise right. it's all theory Right? right. Well, that's great. Theory is awesome. But theory really doesn't help people really relate because there's an energetic sequence of, oh, hey, I know Mike's actually played golf. He's been through the journey. He understands it. I don't have to talk to you. I just know it because why? And it's at that level. And so taking responsibility sounds like this ominous thing. Oh, I've got to take responsibility and become an adult. Being an adult sucks. All right. Let's just cut the crap. I mean, there's nothing cool about being an adult. There's something cool about being mature enough to go, you know what? I really want to create the life I want to create. And that starts with me taking ownership of my life, not from a perspective of anger or blame or this happened to me and therefore I'm going to do that or I'm going to make the rights of the world is to go time out. I want to create this journey because I'm really in this concept and I invite people to look at this. If you've ever been to a theme park, whether you know it's you know Disneyland, Six Flags, whatever, I don't care, wherever it is in the world, you go to a theme park, you go there for one thing, to experience all different kinds of emotions, right? The fear of the roller coaster, the excitement, the spin, the food, the junk food, whatever, the games, and when you leave the theme park, you got to give, you know, you give your ticket back. You don't get back in. Life is exactly like a big theme park. You, it's not the two weeks of vacation a year that you get to go be who you are. It's the entire time you're here and you're on the vacation planet Earth. And the more you start approaching it from that perspective, you can start going, well, what ride do I really want to ride? And own that. And it's okay. And it's so unokay for us to go, you know, Mike, it was really important when I was 26 and 27 and I was Dr. Fox and I really thought I knew something. I was out to save the world because, you know, no one saved me. Bullshit. But that sounded cool at 26 because that gave me the motivation that I needed to get up every right. day to do what I didn't, what I really didn't uh, really want to do, which is to go, hey guys, I'm on this journey to wake myself up. I've designed this system. This is how I did it to wake me up. It may not work for you, but if it does, great. If it doesn't, there's other great teachers out there that are on the same journey. I want to have the greatest experience I have in my life. If you'd like to journey with me, this is the direction I'm going. And it changes things. No different than you're doing with the show, right? Hey, what right. are you made up? Are you willing to admit being a multi-billionaire might not be that important to you. It sounds cool, but the price you're going to pay to get there, as Tom Billy always says, there's a price for it. Are you willing to pay for that price? doesn't mean it's good or bad. It's just what you're interested in. Or is surfing the world with a bunch of good you know, buddies and friends, is that the most important thing to you? And why are, not, why are those not equal? 
We value success on these external things as opposed to what down here makes me jam. If I had 30 days left to live, what I'd be doing in this thing. And the funny thing is when I ask people that question, I've asked from you know, top CEOs to people that, you know, you go, I you shouldn't be speaking to them. They always say the same thing. There's always no. I'm like, well, then what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? Right. If you're not in that space, stop and take ownership. That's the first place to take responsibility and go, I wouldn't be doing any of this. Yeah, but Travis, I got to pay the bills, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, okay, great. We have to do that too. But if you're in your passion, in a different space, and you're being passion, as you said eloquently about your, your 42nd birthday, <clears throat> the world opens up because you finally get out of your damn way of trying to tell you what it think, you think it's supposed to look like. And right. since when did your brain become more intelligent than the entire universe? If, when that happens, I'd say your ego is completely out of control. You might want to check in on that. Right, right. So let me ask you, <clears throat> excuse me, what would you say to the listeners that um, are afraid to make the move or make the jump into looking into your program? And they say, you know, that sounds great and everything. And then they go about their daily lives. What would you say to them to wake them up or to kind of push them off the edge and make them jump? Well, first thing is, um, if you're willing, the first question is, have you tried everything else? And if the answer is yes, okay, great. Did you get the results you were looking for? Well, I got some. Okay. So are you ready to take the jump into the space of stop using excuses of the past to do a new experience? We're so judgmental called the infinite loop where our brain only learns from the past. That's all it knows. It's just a big memory bank, right? And so when we say, well, you know, I've done that before. That's true, but what you're doing is taking that experience and immediately throwing on an imaginary future that has not occurred yet and hasn't happened and said, well, that's what that experience is going to be. And you create this infinite loop where your past becomes your future and then your future becomes your past and you keep repeating the pattern. And so the first question is, how come you're making your past experience your future one? That makes no sense. That is you saying, well, I've already got that experience, therefore every experience out there is the same. Okay. Well, then if that's the case, then take responsibility that your life is going to stay the exact same. The only thing that's going to change is the players and the environment for which you play. So the first thing I'd say is, what are you afraid of from your past that not, makes you not willing to jump? The second is, what are you afraid you might actually look at? Most of us aren't really afraid of the past. We're afraid of the future. We're afraid that we might find out, shit, there is another life that I really want. There's the things I really want to experience. And I'm afraid to tell my, you know, my wife or my husband or my friends or my family, hey, Mike, you know, this has been really cool. I love being the CEO for years and I love the lifestyle, but you know what? I'm out of here. I want to go play all the golf courses in South Africa for the next year. I'm out. And people go, you've lost your mind, Mike. What the hell are you doing? You don't understand. Yeah. You people think you're crazy. You're crazy not to. Because if you're not getting off this planet alive, what the hell are you waiting for? You don't get to save it up for a rainy day. This is not the 401k of life, right? This is, hey, bottom line is you're giving the space suit back. So why not ring out every minute possible? If they say, you know, the average person has 26,000 days of your life, do a count. So by my count where I'm at, you know, on my 49th birthday just happened um, a couple of months ago. And I've been analogized with all my students in our community around the world. I said, hey guys, I'm on the back nine. I just made the turn. So I'm doing a re-eval, made, made, made a double bogey there, made a couple bogeys, made a couple birdies. I'm right about par for the course. I don't want to be par. I want to be all out. So the back nine, I'm swinging for every freaking shot, full ass of committed, you know, knowing the shot, changing caddies, changing a couple of clubs, changing it up from the perspective. And because I'm on my own journey as well. I'm playing for the legacy, right? Not for look how great Travis Fox is, but for the legacy of myself. So I can look back and go, man, every shot I took, I was in it all the way present. I hit that puppy as hard as I could. And once the ball was gone, then the results are the results. And then I'll adjust to the next shot. But being fully present, because if there's only nine holes left, every shot becomes so important. And the walk between those shots, looking around, looking at the golf course, looking at the beauty, looking at great people like yourself and doing great shows and other teachers and hanging out and doing the experiences that matter most because at the end of our life, people don't give a crap about how much money you made, how many houses you own and cars you did, how many people you slept with. You care about the experiences and did you bring out all 26,000 days or you were too much of a chicken shit to take responsibility and say, Mike, I'm leaving. I'm going to go play every golf course in South Africa. You want to jam with me? I'm going. If not, I'm going to go beat some people who want to do that because I want to experience this and that's enough. Yep. Yep. And I've experienced it. I can tell you this. I've experienced it with some, some dreams or passions I've had. And then you hear the naysayers, you hear the, the oh. little digs, the th people throw little digs at you. Oh, yeah. um, because it, what, again, it's a reflection thing. They're think thinking to themselves, well, I want to do something, but I'm not doing it. Why right. should he be able to do it? You right. know, so that, that is, that's a great or point. Or vice man. versa. 
when they're saying it to you, there's still that part of you that's still not owning that you're scared of it or that you have self doubt or that you may, what if someone thinks I've lost my mind? Hey, what if I go, Hey Mike, you know what? I'm out of here. You know, I've decided I'm, I'm going to retire. I don't want to do this anymore. I'm going to go you know, be a beach bum and sit in the middle of Costa Rica and drink coffee all day. I mean, Travis was great. I had him on the show once, but that bro has lost his mind. He's flat out lost his marbles. It isn't Mike that's judging me. It's Travis that's still judging me. And Mike is giving me the honor of reflecting back the part of me inside myself that I'm too scared to go look at. Flip it. Go the other way. Take responsibility for it. You are the center of your world. That's a big pill to swallow right out of the box, but it right. is the most powerful lesson that if you learn that, and if you could teach your kids this, parents, again, I'm a three-time parent and a first-time grandfather, my most powerful lesson that I'm inviting my kids to is to learn to make decisions based on their guts, not on their head. doesn't mean they don't use their intelligence, but it's their guts first and then push it up into your mind and use the intelligence of your past and see where the alignment works to make quality decisions based on what your guts are telling you, not what everything else outside of yeah. you is telling you. That is the most powerful lesson that I've been teaching my kids. I don't know if that's one for everybody else, but I invite parents to look at that. Look at it. Yeah. You know, here's my tactic I use. I don't know if this is something in lines with what you talk about, but when I hear someone throw a little dig, hate, say something funky or try to talk me out of something, I push harder. <laughs> That's just, I have a trigger in my mind when somebody says something, I say, okay, that means I'm not pushing hard enough. And then I go and it's worked so far. I'm going to continue to do it. And I'm trying to teach other people to do that now because it's worked for me. But if somebody says that you're working too hard, oh, man, I'm not working hard enough. Uh, you, what my, are you doing? That? Is, uh, working too hard compared to what? Yeah, exactly. What, what, why so are you doing that podcast? Against, right? why, why are you podcasting all the time? What, what is that? Oh man, I'm not doing enough podcasts. That's what that, <laughs> these are the triggers that come. Right. And uh, you know, that, it's worked great for me. I'm going to continue to do it. Um, yeah. You know, but you know so, and you ahead, should, because as long as it's aligned with you, who gives a crap what everyone else thinks? You want to do podcasts 24 hours a day? Bring it on brother. What a, yep. li what a library and legacy of teachings you're bringing. Now, look, I want to close this down with a couple questions. Okay. And then, uh, then we're going to get your information, how my listeners can reach out to you, connect with you, sure. and uh, what you may have to offer today. But what do you do? Now, we're all human. What do you do when you get in a rut or something bad happens? What's your go-to um, activity or thought? or what? Give me some insight on that, Travis. Yeah. So, well, um, I don't believe in ruts anymore. I used to believe in them. I believe ruts are a self-fulfilling prophecy of you not looking at what you really want. There's an alignment sequence that goes on. And again, that's an unwinding process of unwinding a pattern of the past so that you could either play the victim or play the martyr, or most importantly, keep yourself from being the truly dynamic person that you are. And ownership of that is probably the number one thing I deal with with my private clients and, and the workshops we do is people are truly afraid to be happy to be who the hell they really are and who they really want to be. It's not, they like the rut because the rut's predictable, it's definable, and they've done it enough times now that they kind of know how it goes and there's some safety in that. I'm not saying I haven't done it myself and there aren't times I like to feel sorry for myself because it's something I want to revisit to go, does this feel good? No, nah, not really. Okay, now I can make a different choice. So the first thing I, is ruts are based on what, it, what part of you is afraid to be the you know, proverbial superhero that you really are of your own hero's journey. And what my go-to is, and I hate that sounds self-promoting, is I go to architects. I ask my own students to reflect for me because I, I don't have the illusion that just because I, you know, I'm the quote-unquote head of this and CEO and founder of it doesn't mean that I'm infallible. I'm not. I tell people point blank. Uh, I don't have any answers for you, but I have really damn good questions in the sequence the series that can help you wake yourself up. That, that I do have. But I don't have any answers for you, and I think anybody who tells you they have the answers for you is full of crap. They're selling you something and it's a load of crap because the only person has the right. answers for you, you. That's what I do. So, so now look, what if like, you know, there's some salespeople or entrepreneurs listen to this um, that go through a, a, a downturn or bad cycle of sales or canceled sales or business is slow or like, what do you, what is your go-to for that kind of thing as well? Uh, my go-to is always looking at the, the invite. Right, because what we we're so uh, and it, it's it goes back to sports, right? You never mess with a winning streak. You know, we think winning streaks are going to last forever, but winning streaks are fun and they're enjoyable. But the downturn is where you really learn where creativity lies. That's where you really get to learn 
who you really are. What are you made of? Am I willing to be more creative or am I going to hold on to the shores of the past and go, oh, if I could just stretch this, you know, the sales things out for another quarter, then I'll make it there. Wherever the hell there actually is, is the illusion itself. It's what our creativity lies and we get to dive in deeper and we get to unwind that pattern that we learned and go, okay, I learned that pattern, Mike. And you know what? We had a great run for six months. We did great. Now this is downturn. Now what's the next invitation of my journey? What's the next invitation of how we're going to invite people in? Because I believe sales is a transfer of enthusiasm. It's not buy my stuff, right? Nobody buys anything unless they want to. But it's because they understand the enthusiasm, the authenticity of the offer and the invitation. And that's because you're diving deeper into what am I really passionate about what I'm inviting them to, to buy or, to, or what am I selling? So I get yep. to peel that layer off. That's the time at the valley where, in the valleys where you learn and rest and get creative. And then you start the next journey, whatever that is. Hey, now we got a sales cycle. We're going to go into commercial real estate. Now we're going to go into multifamily unit, whatever you're going into. Or, hey, by the way, Mike, it's been a great run. I've learned so much. I want to shift into the mortgage business or I want to shift into the title business. And well, I don't know it, but that starts that next journey. So it's, it's taking that time to really look and go, what is the creativity? What's that next thing I can unwind? Or am I so busy holding on to the past because I'm afraid that it's going to end? And well, newsflash, it's going to. So invite that end. Look at it because you get to go, man, I did that chapter. That's great, Mike. You know what? I'm going to go to this next level. I don't know what that is yet, but tell you what, I'm going to sit still for three or four days, really ask myself some really deep questions in here. What do I really need to unwind? Where am I going to become more authentic with my invitation? What's the thing I'm really, really passionate about next? And then go instantly go to it and go to that space. And from there, take the journey. Cause remember, you're not getting out of this life alive. So experience it. Now, do you have a real life situation from your past that you can remember <laughs> that where you had a downturn and, and, and how did you get out of it? Oh, pick one. Which one do you like? The twenties, the thirties or the forties. <laughs> just give pick, pick one. Cause I don't know what yeah. they are. Cause I, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think the biggest one for me was, uh, my, when my third child was born, my, my third child was born in my thirties. Um, and, uh, I had the expectation because I'd done the first two and I, you know, I thought I had this parenting thing down to a science. I got um, this third one. I'm just going to play. I'm going to remove all the rules of, you know, you know, trying to teach all the time and try to be a good leader and all this other crap I'd put on myself, you know, not be like my father, all this other stuff. And the third one, I was just going to play. It's just an experience. And the universe had a great invitation for me. The universe said, okay, well, cool. We're going to do that. But we're going to do it for a whole new way. Yeah. What's that? Well, your son's going to be autistic. What? Wait, 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 that, was, that, that wasn't part of the plan. What are you talking about? This was supposed to be, you know, the cool. I was going to talk to him, little one. This is my last one. This is my last child. We're gonna do. No, ironically, he's exactly what I needed. He's exactly what I needed for me to unwind because Dr. Fox had no training what to deal with autism. I, the great communicator, I've done 14,000 hours on stage and all these resume things that sound really cool on paper and I couldn't connect with my own child. It tore me apart. And so from that perspective, I got to really, no different than we just talked about a second ago, I got to unwind what does it really mean to be a parent? What did it, what are the lessons I had to learn that Dr. Fox was an illusion I created in my head and that Travis was good enough and to connect at a whole new level as my son has taught me in the autism space of what does it mean to connect emotionally versus just being a parent and going to the soccer games and doing all those things, which have value, don't get me wrong, but to sit there and have to wait seven years to just play catch with my son for five minutes has taught me lessons of patience, taught me lessons of value, taught me lessons of what's really important in my life. And he has become the single greatest teacher that I've ever had in all of my journey, which is why I don't call myself Dr. Fox anymore because Dr. Fox was a personality I created that sounded really cool after all of my training. So I could send some letters and validate myself because I was still trying to make up for my dad saying, dad, I don't want to be a PGA tour golfer because it's really, you know, having done 10 years, they're not the happiest people on the planet. I'm not saying they all are, but they're not there. That's a job too, 33 weeks out there on the grind. And this is not the passion of my heart. And so he's become that great teacher. And so coming from that perspective has taught me so many things. And 20 years later, uh, you know, now uh, I'm very blessed at who he is because he has his own show on YouTube and he makes edits own shows for other autistic kids uh, that oh, has now awesome. taken me to experiences I've never, you know, been to Sesame Street. I've been to Kids 2 with Baby Einstein, you know, and this whole process that of watching him just be in his passion. And I'll, I'll end with a story that I think will give you perspective that has one of been the greatest lessons I've ever learned. And I'll, I will tell you, he was seven years old and we were in Atlanta, Georgia. And there, you know, the leaves fall in the fall back there. I live in the West Coast, so we don't really have fall. So it's like, oh, leaves, all right, let's go check this out. You know, my two older kids jump in the leaves like all normal kids do play, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Not him. So this one, he sits there and he stares at the pile of leaves. I'm like, hey, buddy, go jump in. He's like, no. He reaches down and he grabs these two leaves and he stares at them for 
feels like forever. It's probably maybe 15 seconds, but it felt like forever. Kind of just stood still. And all of a sudden he starts just crushing these leaves and he's staring at it and he's crushing these leaves and he's so present, Mike. He's so into it and he's so blissful about the experience of the sound and the feel and the texture because to him it's hypersensitive. And then literally being so excited about crushing leaves, I sat there and I watched him for a half hour and I started bawling. I just absolutely cried my eyes out and said, That's I've awesome, never man. been that ha- I've never been that happy in my whole damn life about anything. That's and so this cool. kid, uh, yeah. So the transition came from I I've been in my life, but I haven't really been present in a lot of my life. I've been so busy trying to help people and be Dr. Fox and the great speaker and the, the, the producer and the husband, all these titles of bullshit. And then they're all valuable mm-hmm. from a certain point of view, but really it was just me being everybody else what I thought I was supposed to be. He came along and said, well, Dad, have you ever just crushed leaves and been so excited about that experience? Because when you're dead, you don't get to do that. And he didn't say that, but he said it through his spirit and his energy. And I use that lesson that I learned from him literally 10 years ago to go, what part of your life are you missing? How come you're not so afraid to crush leaves and just be happy enough about that? Are you so afraid to be happy about anything that misery becomes your happiness? And when you're in that space, it's time to unwind your life. Man. Get really clear about what you find out what the hell you're made of. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. Thank you very much, man, for that. I got to tell you, uh, the podcast here, and, and before we started recording, I told you this is kind of like a one-way street. I feel like I get all the benefit here and, and uh, because this content is, first of all, it aligns with my show great. You're an awesome dude, and I appreciate all the contact the content that you provided, and, but I get, a, I get to keep this stuff. Yeah. I know I'm going to publish this stuff and put it out there for everyone, but I get to keep this stuff as a right. library, man, for some <laughs> awesome stuff, man. And I'm just so thankful for you, man. Thank you. Thank man. Thanks Appreciate for being on the show. I mean, I'm, I'm grateful and I'm honored. And, uh, you know, I, I like the title of the show. That's why I said, I agree to be honest. What are you made of? What a great question. And the only person that could answer that is the listener. Right. Well, right. You'll get guidance from us. You'll get guidance from Mike. He's bringing on all these amazing teachers and I'm honored to be one of them and just step back and go, what the hell am I made of? And when you step back and really look at that, Hey man, you're just in a space suit. You're more than what you think you are. And are you willing to go beyond what you think you know and go beyond that space and experience life? Because again, if you only had 30 days left to live, would you be doing anything you're doing right now? And if the answer is no in any way, jump into your life right now as fast as you can. Because if you don't, you're going to wake up one day dead. And that's an undoable regret. So how can, my, uh, how can my audience reach out to you? I know on Instagram, you have a great Instagram account, Travis Fox 360, that number's 360, Travis Fox 360. Yep. Uh, but we're also going to put these in the show notes, but uh, what, what's your website and, and so on? Uh, website's easy. It's my name, travisfox.net. You'll see the jump right there. You can jump in. We have three levels of jump. You can jump in with, uh, it's called the toe dipper. Someone who's just kind of scared, wants to just kind of see what it's about. And then it's the shallow end of the pool. And then of course, there's the deep end. You choose your level and your, your journey. It all explains it right there on the site and you can go there. And then of course, you know, the Travis Fox 360 is also on Twitter. It's also on Facebook as well. And you can always visit our, our YouTube channel, which is Travis Fox Architect B. And just check it out, man. It's all out there, you know, just enjoy it or reach out to one of the other architects. But that's how you find me. And more importantly, you know, reach out to Mike. Mike knows how to find me. Guys, go support Travis. Great guy. And uh, I'm, I'm backing him uh, any way I possibly can help you, Travis. Just let me know. I uh, appreciate you, you coming on today, man. And uh, happy new year to you uh, for 2020. And you guys have been listening to the What Are You Made Of with Mike C. Rock podcast. Guys, listen, remember, there's a book coming out, the What Are You Made Of book. Uh, I'm working hard on that. And I'm looking forward to getting my story out to millions and millions of people to inspire millions. And uh, just be looking for that. Pre-sale will be up soon. And uh, thank you to Nations Lending for sponsoring Home Loans Made Human. If you need a home loan, buying, selling, or refinancing, just reach out to your boy C-Rock. I have a fantastic team, and we'll be happy to help you out. So thank you for listening, and please subscribe to the podcast. Subscribe to us on it's Mike C-Rock on uh, YouTube, and follow me at Mikey C-Rock with no K, C-R-O-C on Instagram and Twitter. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being a part of the What Are You Made Of podcast. So that you don't miss future episodes, please rate and subscribe to the What Are You Made Of podcast on your favorite listening or viewing apps and follow me on your favorite social media platforms. I would love to hear your stories and past experiences and engage with you further.